The Self-Learning Blueprint, a strategic plan to break down complex topics, comprehend deeply, and teach yourself anything. Written by Peter Hollins, narrated by Russell Newton. Imagine you're starting a business. You've found a great product, and you're certain the market is going to go crazy for it. All your friends have agreed that they would definitely buy your product. Even better, a Google search shows that no one else has had the idea to sell this particular product. You're going to be rich. You start browsing private yachts online. The same friends say that you're being premature, but you don't know what that word means, so you ignore them. Excited by the opportunity, you build a website, buy loads of your product to keep up with your predicted demand, and prepare to ship your goods to customers. All you need to do now is buy some advertisements and wait for the orders to roll in. Business is easy. Why don't more people start their own company? But, of course, things take a wayward turn. You're shocked to see your website advertising costs far exceed your income. Every month you're losing money, and you've made only one sale. That sale was later returned for a refund. There was never any demand for your product, and your friends lied to you to be nice, and the product itself was ludicrous. Why did you find yourself in this position, and could it have been prevented? Proficient businessmen don't just come up with a great idea and cash in. They study and learn far before ever taking action, and when they do take action, they act in ways they know will produce the profit they seek. The failure here wasn't just one of marketing or website design. It was a failure to understand the process of self-learning and how it contributes to anything novel or new in your life. This was a high-stakes situation with a lot of investment, and you set yourself up for failure by not taking the initiative to self-learn. In reality, the ability to teach yourself both simple and complex information is the silent determinant of whether you ever get from point A to point B. Sadly, it's often only after failure does it occur to look to mentors, classes, books, or even podcasts to determine what we do wrong and how we can succeed next time. With business people, this lets them learn to analyze markets, giving them a fair idea of whether their product will be met with open arms or ignored entirely. They also learn about different methods of advertising, allowing them to reach exactly the niches they need for their product to take off. Imagine if you had understood this to be part of the process before you opened your wallet and flushed money down the toilet. Of course, learning on the job and in the moment is also fine, but the skill of learning still must be cultivated. Now, imagine another scenario. You're learning to play guitar. You don't want to be a rock star but playing some songs around a fire on camping trips with your kids sounds like a fun way to bond and pass the time. You pick up a guitar, spend some time strumming, and are amazed by the cacophony that can emanate from a single, relatively small stringed instrument. After thoroughly annoying the family you're trying to please, you decide that you need some help. After considering your budget and the time you have available to learn, you decide that YouTube videos and websites are the best way to learn. You set aside 20 minutes after dinner as learning time and devote yourself to understanding chords and strumming techniques. You make sure to understand the scales and theories before delving into more complex songs. In no time at all, you can read music well enough to play campfire songs and even add in some new riffs of your own. Because you set aside time and properly expended the effort needed to learn something new, you gained the ability to amuse yourself and entertain your friends and family. There are considerably lower stakes here and yet far different results. In both examples, the key to success was the arduous process of self-learning. It can feel tedious or even impossible because you'll have no idea where to start. But this stage of discomfort and confusion must be traversed for anything new in your life. You can consult experts and learn from instructional materials. You can also create your own curriculum based on the knowledge gap between where you currently are and where you want to be. What matters is that by putting time and energy into acquiring new knowledge and mastering new skills, you can get to exactly where you want to be. 
and once you're there, new doors will open as well. Both of our examples produced a profit. One was monetary and the other was social, but both acts of learning led to a net increase in quality of life for the learners. All it took was time, effort, and the willingness to apply the knowledge gleaned from expert sources. Self-learning is what unlocks our potential in every aspect of life. However, if it were an easy task, everyone would be exactly where they want to be. It's not comfortable or easy. How we learned to learn as children is rarely the best real-life approach. The prospect of creating your own strategy and plan can be overwhelming, and whoever said it was supposed to feel like you aren't working. In addition, it turns out that there are quite a few mental blocks people have surrounding self-learning that aren't even about the process itself. They begin with the various myths, which typically amount to the statement, you need X to learn, and if X is not present, you're forever doomed. These myths keep many people from even getting started onto the path they desire. It's worth spending some time to dispel these myths so that we can dive fully into learning afterwards without any reservations. The Myth of Requirements Many myths are empowering and serve as points of inspiration. For instance, the ancient Greek myth of Perseus slaying the snake-haired Medusa to serve as a rallying cry that the impossible is actually quite possible. Unfortunately, this is not the case with learning. Mostly, learning myths serve to create perceived barriers, such as a certain style, a certain formula, a certain motivation even, are necessary to effectively think and learn. From the myth of innate learning styles to the falsehood that intelligence quotient, IQ, and thus intellectual capacity is stable throughout life, many consider themselves to be stuck where they are. None of that is true, and there are no real prerequisites besides having an intention and some self-discipline. This section is about debunking those disempowering myths and allowing yourself even the possibility to get started to learn. Innate intelligence or talent is needed. Can only innately intelligent people learn adequately? Are some of us just not capable of picking things up? Are we only meant for some tasks versus others? No, no, and no. In fact, inborn talent is only a minor factor in determining learning success. Mindset, as it turns out, is the most significant differentiator between successful and unsuccessful learners. Studies have shown that people with a growth mindset who believe they can improve with time and effort fare much better than people who may have more talent but believe that intelligence is a fixed attribute. There are a lot of reasons for this. People who believe intelligence is fixed set up barriers to their own success. While that sounds counterintuitive, it makes more sense if you consider that innately intelligent people don't push themselves to excel because they believe it would be useless. They may start from a higher level of performance, but they are unable to diversify and rise beyond a certain point. This limits the number and type of things they can learn. Others will accept subpar performance in areas they're just not good at, even when consulting more resources and expanding more effort could easily lead to excellence in those abandoned areas of study. By contrast, people with a growth mindset, regardless of their initial aptitude for a given subject, know that with time, effort, and proper instruction, they can master any field. They see that the world is their oyster of opportunity. Unlike people who believe their talents determine their capacities, they know that initial failure is not a reason for despair. Instead, they see failure for what it is, an opportunity for further learning and a lesson about what not to do that they aren't likely to forget. In addition to being unafraid of failure, people with the growth mindset have shown a willingness to take more chances, which dramatically expands the types of pursuits they can learn and master. They've also been shown to progress faster while learning, probably because they're less likely to be discouraged or accept their stumbles as permanent blocks to their progress. The fact is, growth-oriented individuals are right when they flout the common wisdom that intelligence is set at birth. 
Each of us learns as we age, from infancy onward. We start out by flailing in our cribs, and then learn to raise our heads and crawl. Soon, we're taking our first steps and speaking with our parents and siblings. Eventually, we're learning algebra, reading literature, and doing our own science experiments. All of this is part of the inescapable path through human life. We begin undeveloped and unskilled, but our brains grow, evolve, and change with use, not just in childhood, but until the day we die. Each day is an opportunity to learn, be, and do more than we ever imagined possible. All we have to do is take matters into our own hands, believe in ourselves, study from the masters, and practice new skills until their successful execution becomes part of who we are. Certain learning styles are needed. A second pervasive myth is that we each have unique learning styles that make it easier or harder for us to learn from certain methods and in certain mediums. This myth goes on to say that each of us is mentally programmed in a different way, such that certain styles are necessary to reach our potential. This widespread school of thought originated from the research of a psychologist named Howard Gardner, who published the book Frames of Mind, The Theory of Multiple Intelligences, in 1983, Gardner outlined eight different types of intelligence, linguistic, logical-mathematical, musical, bodily kinesthetic, spatial, interpersonal, intrapersonal, and naturalist. These intelligences don't describe individual skills but form part of a collective. As Gardner describes in his original theory, each intelligence is a branch of a single system of acquiring knowledge. These different branches are meant to work together to facilitate different, additional approaches to teaching people new material. Unfortunately, pop culture transformed his work into a way of differentiating between people. Journalists and other well-meaning people promoted the idea that each of us has different ways in which we are more or less intelligent, and we have different styles of intelligence or learning that we are more or less capable of performing successfully. This served to excuse students who performed poorly and offered an alluringly easy solution. If we presented the material in a different form, they would learn more easily. Studies on the topic have debunked this theory. Every single study on the topic. When people were given material to learn in their preferred style, they didn't show any tendency to learn material better or more quickly. Instead, it was discovered that everyone regardless of their preferences, learned material best when it was presented in a form that suited the material being learned. This makes intuitive sense. While everyone is different, we aren't so different that some of us learn sports better by reading about them. That always has to be a kinesthetic aspect. Similarly, languages must be heard and read if they're going to be pronounced and written correctly. Gardner's original theory of multiple intelligences lines up with these findings exactly. He posited that each of us used all these methods to learn and thought that being aware of these different avenues might help teachers find more ways to communicate with every student, not just those with learning styles that were suited to novel approaches. A similar, also debunked myth about learning and the brain insisted that some people were right-brained or left-brained. Left-brained people were supposed to be more logical, while right-brained people were more artistic. Many believed that because of these supposedly biological differences, people needed to learn and act in line with their own skills and limitations. The myth arose because of some brain scans that showed different levels of activity in each hemisphere doing different activities. But more recent brain scans have showed that the brain functions as one unit in these intellectual pursuits. In reality, the brain operates in a more holistic way in all people. We all use 100% of our brains on both sides of our heads, and we aren't limited to having only a logical or artistic aptitude. Many excel at both types of learning, and so can you. Certain motivation is needed. A third mistake people make is waiting for the motivation to learn something new to come along. They believe there must always be a light at the end of the tunnel. This, a form of waiting for inspiration to strike, is a mistake. Let's face it, 
no one's going to enjoy or feel some inherent motivation or desire to learn something they simply don't care about. Whether it's calculus or a new piece of software, the end goals do not always justify the means. There's no way it's always going to have an enjoyable or pleasurable element, and there's not always a silver lining. If we take those statements to be true, it means that motivation isn't what will get you off the couch. Confidence is. Confidence is your belief in your ability to attain a specific goal. If you have high confidence, you believe you can accomplish the task you've set out to do. If you have low confidence, you're afraid you're going to fail in reaching your goals. High confidence drives you toward learning because you know if you stumble or fall, you'll be able to pick yourself right back up again. You know you're competent, capable, and able to finish what you start. This confidence motivates you to continue, as there's no internal friction preventing you from careening toward your goals. By contrast, low confidence is riddled with fear and doubt. When you're not confident, you wonder what will happen if you make mistakes, and you become afraid of how many mistakes you'll make. Lacking confidence, you compare yourself to others who have achieved your goal and you wonder how you could ever hope to achieve that level of greatness. When you don't have confidence, every imperfection stands out like a testament to your incompetence, and it feels like finishing your project is impossible. Why even get off the couch at all in that case? Learning is hard work. It takes time and effort. Genuinely challenging yourself to learn new information never comes easily for anyone. There's no reason to wait around for the mood to study to strike. That mood will probably never come. Learning isn't always fun, and it isn't something you can only do when it feels good. Learning is how we become more than we already are. It's difficult, but if you have a sense of security in what you can accomplish, then what's the holdback in getting started besides some laziness? A certain amount of time is needed. Even when people know things they could learn to improve their lives, many put off that learning by claiming not to have enough time. This excuse is exacerbated by the public notion that it takes massive amounts of time to become proficient in a new skill or hobby. Avoidance of learning is actually encouraged by a rule of thumb popularized in Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers, The Story of Success. In it, Gladwell claims that it takes 10,000 hours of practice to master a new skill. With such a high benchmark for success, it's no surprise that many look at that figure and decide they're too busy to learn. After all, if failure is guaranteed by an inability to generate 10,000 hours of free time, why should someone start learning something new? In that time, you could watch hundreds of movies, go on hundreds of dates, and nap for hundreds of hours with time to spare. Fortunately, this myth is as false as it is pervasive. If you spend three hours shooting a bow and arrow on your own, you'd learn a little bit. But compare that time in undirected self-study to three hours spent with an expert marksman who can watch and correct your form and better direct your focus toward the techniques you need to master. Are both sessions likely to be equally effective? Of course not. Having a teacher makes it quicker and easier to learn the skills you need and eliminate the bad habits that inevitably surface when you begin to practice any skill. And, of course, having a strategic plan combined with some self-discipline will also get you there faster than you might think. Gladwell's 10,000 hours completely ignores the reality that the quality of practice matters a good deal more than the quantity of practice we perform. According to best-selling author Daniel Goleman, deliberate practice usually requires someone with an expert eye to help you identify the specific ways you can improve and to motivate you to reach your greatest heights. Without such feedback, you don't get to the top ranks. The feedback matters, and the concentration does, too, not just the hours. With expert guidance, we can eject our mistaken notions and bad habits and get to our destination in the shortest amount of time possible. With deliberate, quality practice, we can employ special techniques and shortcuts that transform learning from a long road littered with self-reinforcing mistakes to a shorter, easier road where mistakes are spotted early and proper techniques are mastered swiftly. When we have good guidance, 
whether it's in the form of a mentor or quality instructional materials, we have our attention and our practice focused and we become more efficient learners. In brief, it really is possible to work smarter, not harder. And when we do that, we save a lot of time. In short, the 10,000-hour rule is somewhat incomplete, and though learning is linear, you can certainly think smarter and not harder. Macro and Micro Planning Now you know that you don't need to be talented. You don't need to cater to learning styles, and you don't need boatloads of time to learn a new skill. There are no true prerequisites, except perhaps a willingness to work hard. So, what is actually needed? Well, a plan. Specifically, two plans. Planning should be done at the macro and micro levels. At the macro level, you examine your overall goals and purposes for learning. This is where you make sure that you're spending your time the way you want to. At the micro level is when you plan out your days and hours with activities specifically suited to reaching those goals. Here, you make sure that the time you're spending yields the result that you desire. The macro level can be accomplished by following six steps. First, decide what you want to learn. This seems obvious, but there are better and worse things to spend your time on. When considering a course of action, you'll want to first consider your strengths and weaknesses. Often, whether it's in work or in play, we're better off emphasizing and developing our strengths than we are trying to minimize our failings. After all, no one's going to ask us to do everything. And when we really have trouble, acquiring help from others is always possible. But excellence in one area or a small group of areas easily transforms us into experts in our fields, which is a highly desirable place to be. Emphasizing your strengths when you choose an area to develop is a good idea. Of course, if you want to learn something totally new, that's also something you can accomplish. Even if you're only looking to advance your professional skill set, you should still consider what you want to do when choosing a subject to learn or a skill to develop. Career paths are a consideration, but it's even more important to consider what sorts of activities make you happy and unhappy. You don't want a degree in accounting if you hate numbers, after all, even if it would improve your paycheck. Paths that align with your interests and are emotionally fulfilling are usually more rewarding. Consider Darlene, who works as a web developer. She wants to have greater control over the processes that occur on her websites rather than outsourcing for code when she needs it to perform certain functions she can't create herself. Moreover, she wants to be able to manipulate that code and make it from scratch so that she completely understands what's on her pages. Her vision for her learning is gaining knowledge of more types of code so that she can be a more competent, better-rounded web developer. The second step is analyzing your current skills and experiences to spot gaps in knowledge. Where are you lacking compared to your future self? What do you already know and do well? What do you still need to learn? Can other people fill in these gaps in knowledge for you? Or do you need to step up to the plate and seek out additional resources? Once you find areas in which you need to improve, you'll be able to discern specific areas you can study and skills you should develop to come closer to your goals. This gives your plan a concrete shape because you'll know exactly what you're missing to get to point B. Darlene already develops web pages for a living and knows the most current versions of HTML and CSS by heart, but she currently outsources certain types of coding to others. This leads to problems with version control and gives her a sense of powerlessness over that aspect of her job. She decides to start with Java, as that's the code she most often interacts with without understanding. Third, Identify the proper solution to your problem or deficiency or goal. This is about surveying your resources. Part of this will depend on your temperament. Are you a self-starter, or do you learn better in a classroom setting? Do you need a source of knowledge you can pick up and put down as your schedule allows? Or can you afford to set up regular appointments with a teacher to develop a skill? Your schedule 
income, and preferences all play a role in determining the right resources to seek and employ. Lots of learning resources exist in the modern world, from books, journals, web pages, and podcasts, to seminars, work teams, and formal classes, to one on one instructional training in formal and informal settings. When choosing a resource to learn from, it's important to consider your own learning preferences. But that's only one of many considerations. You must also consider the reputation of your source or teacher and whether you'll gain any formal credentials from studying with a specific teacher or demonstrating competence in a certain field. It's also essential to consider convenience, because a class you can't go to is not useful, no matter how well regarded the teacher may be. By contrast, solo studying offers no emotional or technical support from others, while a course or a tutoring situation may involve substantial help and oversight from someone else. If this might be valuable in the area you're studying, it could be worth paying for. Darlene is highly motivated but often pressed for time. She considers community college courses, learning from books and journals, and even hiring a private tutor, but ultimately decides to engage in one of the many online programs to help her develop her skills on her own schedule. These courses won't automatically get her credentials, but she's aware that she could take a skills test to certify herself once she gains skill mastery, and as she will have an immediate use for Java in her current job, she's not worried about being unable to use her new knowledge in the future. The fourth step is developing your learning blueprint. Once you know what you want to accomplish, you should look for people who have already accomplished your goal. These people will serve as a step-by-step -step guide for how to get to where you want. If the person is famous or no longer living, you can research their life to figure out how they became who you want to become. If they're not particularly famous or renowned, even better, as you can approach them personally and ask about their road to success. Take note of any struggles, education, or personal relationships they had to overcome or pursue to reach their goals, and try to find ways to mimic this path in your own life. This can give you deeper insight into skills to focus on and paths to pursue once your initial research project is complete. Darlene sits down and has a conversation with her team supervisor about the best ways to advance her career and land a comparable job to her mentor when the time is right. He tells her about specific skills she'll need to learn and certifications she'll need to complete once she gains the skills she needs. He'll tell her about the struggles to expect and how to overcome them. Darlene may ultimately choose a different path, but researching blueprints provides clarity and information. The fifth step is to develop measurable goals. Your learning goals should be simple, specific, and easy to quantify. You need to set up deadlines where you'll measure yourself against your expected progress using the metrics you devised and you need to stick to that schedule. Placing your goals and expectations in a public, visible space will increase accountability by ensuring that others are aware of your project and your expectations. Remember, you should be acquiring specific, measurable skills and abilities by set points in time, and these benchmarks should all be in service of your larger learning goal. If you've chosen a more formal environment, your class times may be set for you, but you still must set aside time to study, learn, and practice on your own time. No class gives you all the practice you need to master its skill set on the teacher's time. If you're engaging in self-study, setting up a consistent schedule for studying on your own is even more essential. Keep in mind, genuinely mastering a skill takes a little time even with the best techniques, so be generous in the study windows you provide yourself. You don't only want time to read or watch a video, but also to reflect upon what you've learned, perform meaningful exercises, and catch and correct the errors you are inevitably going to make. Darlene makes a schedule for herself based on the units offered in her online course, sets aside specific times to undertake each course, and allot blocks of time to study each unit. She allocates a specific time each week to take the unit's quiz. She programs this into her phone so that she doesn't forget the plan and prints a copy of her calendar to put on her cubicle wall. 
She stays on track throughout the months, and as a result, she will reach her goal of programming proficiency. Sixth, set aside time throughout to reflect on what you're learning and reevaluate whether you're progressing at your maximum capacity. After all, if one method isn't working, that doesn't mean you're hopeless. Sometimes all you need is more accountability or greater independence to really shine. You want a learning plan that sets your skills where you want them to be, not something that isn't clicking and is therefore wasting your time. A chef will always taste their food while they're making it. You should assess your progress in a similar way. Darlene sticks diligently to her plan and is happy with her progress, but finds the course itself a little low on support for her needs. She solves this problem by approaching her supervisor with questions when she needs further clarification. He's happy to help her along. Ultimately, she gains the skills she needs and becomes a more efficient, more skilled employee. The macro level of a self-learning plan is not complex. In fact, it is quite simplistic. It mostly articulates a systematic process of optimizing the path you're taking. However, at the micro level, there's still a blank. We haven't yet described the specific techniques and day-to-day -day activities you'll have to complete to transform learning from an idle way to pass time into a method of gaining skills that will serve you throughout your life. Learning is the act of taking in information. But then what? The first step, finding a video or book and sitting down to passively absorb the information it contains, is never the problem. Even the macro plan isn't hard, and most of it will come as second nature or common sense. The hard part is transforming the knowledge we're exposed to into stable, long-term memories we can use. What do we do with the information to truly learn it? How do we go from merely being able to recite E equals MC squared to understanding how to apply it and why it works? There are four main pillars to self-learning that we will introduce here and cover throughout the book. Let me rephrase that. The first technique to aid learning is transforming and synthesizing information. This is simply to put new information into your own words. When we memorize verbatim, we may recall what we're taught, but we don't always have a solid grasp of what we're regurgitating. When we don't solidly grasp information, we haven't fully integrated it into our existing knowledge. We're left with alien-sounding, unconnected factoids that are easier to forget than to remember. An example when learning an instrument is to translate the notes on the page into a visual representation of where it is on the instrument by drawing a picture or describing the placement. By contrast, when we put information into our own words, it's rephrased in a language we intimately understand. The practice of rephrasing a concept necessitates us taking an idea into our heads, pausing to consider the essential and tertiary facts involved, and reiterating the essential and supplemental themes in new language. Rephrasing an idea requires really thinking about that idea, and concerted conscious thought helps us remember what we've learned. Personalizing the language by making it specific to the way you speak also makes the knowledge feel more significant to you as an individual, which also helps retention. We remember what's significant to us. Will this be on the test? This refrain, parroted endlessly by students, is meant to inform students when they can stop paying attention. If it isn't on a test, the logic goes, it doesn't matter. When you're educating yourself, you can and should also set up tests. Unlike what school children believe, tests don't just exist to create a measurable grade, and they certainly aren't an end goal to reach before you can dump useless knowledge from your brain. They're an evaluation tool that forces you to memorize and practice the act of retrieving information from your memory. They force you to learn and recall beyond your comfort zone. Just rereading and highlighting will not get you where you want to go. You can test yourself to gain this form of accountability and subject mastery. It doesn't only let you know what you know, and thus what you need to study, but it also helps reinforce the material you learn each time you test yourself. If you push yourself into more testing, you'll not only learn the parts you find easy or intuitive, 
but also the facts that are more difficult and time-consuming for you to retain. So, it's just like when Marty McFly traveled through time? The third pillar to help you understand and remember what you learn is linking the new knowledge to things you already know. When you create an association between two pieces of information, recalling one will help you recall the other. Instead of two discrete pieces of information that are only accessed independently, you wind up with a single, complex nexus of information, with one idea bringing the associated concept to mind automatically. Two specific tricks that help you connect new information to existing mental models are to find analogies and create concrete examples. In both of these techniques, we require understanding to find similarities and differences between two unrelated disciplines. Give me some space. Finally, the brain needs space to absorb new information. Cramming doesn't work because it's an attempt to put too much information into the brain at once. Our systems get overloaded and can't hold on to any information that way. In the end, the brain, for all the things we assign to it, is a biological thing with biological limitations. We innately know that an athlete would need to rest between intense workouts for best performance. Take care to treat your brain the same way in the process of learning. Just because you've read X number of pages does not mean the brain will intake X pages. We cannot function properly without sleep. Even machines need to refuel and cool down. Space is required in both rest and separation from the material. Takeaways The process of self-learning is deceptively simple. That is, when you strip away all the myths surrounding it, usually amounting to prerequisites to achieve your goals. The myths will usually revolve around the concept of innate intelligence determining your potential, certain learning styles being necessary, certain motivations being important, or a certain predetermined rate of progress based on duration of time. These are harmful and disempowering because they tell you that you can't. There are no real requirements to learning other than a willingness and a dash of self-discipline. But what is massively helpful in challenging that willingness and self-discipline is a set of two plans, a macro and micro plan. The macro plan has to do with the reasons you're going to devote your time to learning something, while the micro plan has to do with the actual activities you should engage in on a daily basis. The former ensures that you end up at a goal that you desire, while the latter ensures that you achieve that goal. This has been the Self-Learning Blueprint, a strategic plan to break down complex topics, comprehend deeply, and teach yourself anything. Written by Peter Hollins, narrated by Russell Newton. Copyright 2019 by Peter Hollins. Production copyright by Peter Hollins.